Hey everybody, Eric from Green Eye Tactical. Uh, wanted to do a, a more deep dive video than the, the short one I did on Instagram on holster safety. Uh, I've seen a recent article uh, that kind of popped up on a, a certain brand holster that got recalled because it had the tendency of sweeping off a safety on a pistol that's already not drop safe to begin with, uh, which is bad, you know. Uh, and this is kind of a preventable thing. Uh, everybody's heard of that saying, there's, there's two types of people. People who have had an accidental discharge and people who have not had one yet. And honestly, I think that's a load of crap, right? It's, it's usually not one mistake that's going to get you an accidental discharge, right? It's going to be a cascade of failures. And I know it's kind of vogue in the industry, people kind of nitpicking words with uh, what, what's an AD, what's an ND, whatever, man. If, if that gun goes off, and you didn't intend it to go off, it's an accidental discharge. You can split hairs later. Could be because you did something fundamentally wrong with your, your, your finger on the trigger, or it could be a mechanical failure. Either way, it's your fault. You're responsible for your equipment, inspecting it, whether it's your, a failure of your weapon, your holster, sear, what have you. It's your fault. You know, Keep, keep track of your stuff, right? Inspect your gear. An AD is an AD. Uh, with that... Kind of want to uh, talk about holsters and pistols, but let's just go ahead and start off with the the four firearms rules, right? So there's different variations to these, and a lot of times they they kind of emanate from the the Cooper's rules, uh, which are good. Uh, I, I cover them, you know, slightly different. There's different variations uh, depending on what discipline you prescribe to, uh, but the way I cover them is handle weapons if they're loaded at all times, right? Uh, I, I don't treat these as sporting or, or hunting gear or, or what have you. Uh, these are tools uh, to me. Uh, and they're tools with one sole purpose, uh, and that's to apply deadly force, period. Uh, they can be adapted or used for, for different things like competitions or sport, target shooting or whatnot, but you're using them for that. I mean, they're, they're designed with one purpose, really. And that's how I look at them. And so that rule is really just about treating these things with the respect that they deserve, right? So because of that, because we're, we're doing dry fire, this isn't live fire, there's no live ammunition anywhere on this table. I've, I've inspected it. There's no live ammunition in this room. Don't want it anywhere near here, right? Uh, you know, I trust myself not to put it in there, but, you know, hey, again, cascade of failures, right? R remove any links in the chain that's going to cause failure, right? And if you keep up those good habits of safety when your mental capacity is diminished because you're tired, you know, what, what have you, you won't have an accident, right? Don't place yourself in a position to have an accident. Second rule, never let the muzzle point at anything you're not willing to destroy, right? Now, we want to look at this as not an absolute rule, you know, uh, kind of think of it as risk management. I've got some guns on the table here. Are they pointed at something that we don't intend to destroy, I bring this up in classes all the time. People are like, oh, hey, but they're, they're clear. Did, did you clear them? Right? Sure, the slides are locked to the rear. Could something cause these things to let the slide go forward? Like maybe if I, I hit it on the table or, you know, are you sure there's not a round in the chamber? No. If we thought that, then we'd be violating what? First rule, right? Treat weapons as if they're loaded at all times. Just treating it with respect. Right? So we take steps to mitigate that risk. I've got all the actions open, slides locked to the rear. I've already cleared these, but before I manipulate them, I'm going to clear them again. Just because good habits of safety, right? Stay disciplined, always good habits of safety, all the time, right? The third rule is really the king rule. And that's what really mitigates a lot of the risks to, to where these are uh, uh, pointed or whether they're holstered or, or what have you. It doesn't mean I'm going to, you know point these things, you know, negligently in, in areas that I don't want them to, uh, but just understand it could be a possibility, right? And that third king rule is keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on target, right? To, until you've referenced this thing at, at something you intend to destroy, keep your finger off the trigger, right? Once you've determined it's a threat, decided to engage, and have the weapon pointed at the threat, then place your finger on the trigger. So really that third rule is, as I teach it, it's tied to a thought process, right? Because you should be a decision maker behind the trigger, right? So it's not an arbitrary part of my presentation, 
right? It's tied to a deliberate thought process because I, I may have to present my weapon at a point where I'm not ready to fire yet, depending on the, the situation that, that, that could happen, right? So trigger finger placement's always tied to a deliberate thought process because I'm deciding to place and be ready to fire, period, right? That's really the, the king rule there. And number four, be sure of your target. Know what it is, what is in line with it, what is in front of it, what is behind it. Never shoot at anything you've not positively identified and understand the overpenetration possibilities of your target, right? So that's talking about situational awareness around, not just around you, but also around your target area. Know what's around your surroundings. You'll see that when I'm picking up my weapon here in this video. I'm not going to pick it up, you know, get my, my full box and proper presentation just to look cool. I'm filming this at my house. It's in one of my rooms, right? It's a residential area. There's houses around me, right? So even though I know these are are unloaded, I'm still not going to violate that first rule. Treat weapons if they're loaded at all times. So I'm going to keep it pointed down in a safe direction. So if there was a lapse in judgment or, or, or whatever, if I have an accidental discharge, it's not going to go zipping through one of my walls and into a neighbor's house, right? Always good, rigid safety habits. Always, right? So that's it. Four firearms rules. Just different variations or, or thoughts about them. You know, no big deal. Uh, so, the next thing that we really want to talk about here, and yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drink Monster here during this video, is uh, holster selection. I've got a wide variety of holsters here, some that people have left, you know, during courses because they, you know, decided they weren't running well for them. Some of them are mine. Uh, uh, one of the things you're not going to see on this table are nylon Uncle Mike floppy holsters, right? It's not one of them. And uh, I'm going to tell you why. So holsters should really accomplish uh, a couple tasks or a few tasks, right? The, the first task that it should accomplish is it should hold our firearm, right? Now, a good check might be, number one, this, this has a retention device built into it. But if I, if I take another uh, holster out here, it doesn't. It should be able to hold my weapon securely, right? should be able to tilt it upside down, you know, wiggle it. It shouldn't fall out. Another check you can do is take a, a, a weighted magazine, uh, uh, put some snap caps in it or something like that, or, or be very careful and take a loaded magazine, ensuring the chamber is clear. Send the slide forward first or whatnot. Hold it upside down. Wiggle it. Make sure that it's going to actually hold that in case you become inverted in a struggle or something like that. Or, hey, you know, if you're a federal agent and doing breakdancing moves, you know, on the dance floor, you know, and you decide to do a handstand, your weapon doesn't fall out on the dance floor and go skittering across. I don't know why anyone would do that, but I hear it's happened, right? Uh, so it should hold our firearm. Now, some of these holsters here uh, will have active retention devices, uh, like this Safari Land here, which is designed to make it more difficult for somebody to snatch a gun out of the holster should your situational awareness fail and you allow somebody to get within arm's reach of you and you know get your hands on your weapon, right? That's fine. Some of them will use uh, uh, friction. Uh, some may have adjustable friction, like this sidecar holster here, uh, where you've got uh, uh, a nut here that you can turn to actually adjust the retention. Uh, a lot of my holsters will have that feature, right? So should be able to hold. Possibly re retain, you know, if that's something that you're you're uh, wanting in your holster. The next thing, and, and really the main thing that we want from a holster, is we want it to be able to protect the trigger. Right? Remember that third rule, that king rule. Weapon shouldn't go unless I place my finger on that trigger and command it to do so. Unless it's a SIG P320 and I'm dropping it on the floor, bumping it up against a wall. Is it too soon for that joke? I might get some hate mail in the comments. Uh, that's something the nylon holster won't do, right? So just as the weapon shouldn't go off in case we, in, unless we command it to do so with our finger, if there's if that holster allows something to protrude into that trigger guard while we're carrying it, it could cause it, command it to go off, right? Because that the gun doesn't have a brain, right? It, it's it's an inanimate object that doesn't think. If if this trigger is moved sufficiently and it's loaded, it's in a condition ready to fire, it's going to go off, period. And the majority of our firearms out there, we, we don't have mechanical safeties on them, you know, other than that trigger block, which hey, it depends on how much something protrudes in there to be able to deactivate that piece of equipment, right? So nylon holsters don't necessarily do that. 
right? Fingers, keys, whatever. You could you can get enough protrusion in there to actually be able to cause the weapon to go off. Uh, and that's just while it's holding it, right? Okay, we'll, we'll get to during the holstering process, right? So that's really what, we, what we're looking for with holsters. Now, we could have other requirements, concealability, comfort, how it's riding as to whether or not I'm printing or, or whatnot, what position we're carrying, whether it's appendix, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, you know, or, you know, if you think shoulder holsters are cool, maybe, you know, whatever. But we, we kind of want it to accomplish those tasks. Now, holstering a weapon you know, arguably can be one of the more dangerous things we do with a firearm. That's where accidents can can really occur. Beyond, you know, visually clearing a holster to make sure our garments, you know, our little tassels, you know, from our, our jackets or whatever, uh, you know, aren't going to get in there and, and cause it to go off. The holster itself could cause issues, right? So when I'm looking at holsters, hey, hard molded plastic, Kydex, I'm not a huge leather fan. There's some leather holsters here. Uh, they, they were just kind of left. Uh, if you're going to use leather, we want it to be a hard leather. And we want to watch leather will soak up sweat and become deformed. I've actually got one holster here that's gotten deformed to the point where it actually causes uh, you know, a Glock trigger to be activated on holstering. So something we kind of want to be careful of with selecting holsters. Uh, part of our, our checks regularly with our holsters uh, when we've got them, so we should do a, a good overall safety inspection of them, right? A good visual inspection. Are, are there any cracks exterior? I should be able to give it a squeeze, you know, see if any anything exposes, is anything loosened up. If we have any nuts, you know, on them, are, are they torqued to the proper spec, you know, uh, for, for retention? Has anything loosened up? If there's a retention device, hey, you know, give it a, give it a wiggle, make sure it moves cleanly uh, and does what it's supposed to do, right? Uh do a, a sweep inside, right, with your finger. Check for any burrs, hard spots, any uh, debris, any obstructions that are in there that could either cause the pistol to not seat fully or could activate the trigger, right? Good safety inspection with, with the holsters. Now, what I, what I want to get into next is a, a check that we do in, in all my courses just to make sure that this holster is not going to activate the, the trigger during the holstering process. And, and I, like I said, I have run into some holsters that, that will do that, right? Uh, and I've mentioned that holstering the weapon, uh, you know, can be one of the more dangerous things that you, you do with it, right? So before we start holstering weapons with live rounds in them, when we're going to work from the draw, uh, exposed, or from concealment, I want to make sure that they're, they're safe and there's nothing going on with them, right? Now, because that can be a troubleshooting process, I want to start ruling some things out. So one of the first things that you want to rule out is a possible mechanical failure with your weapon, which you should be doing regularly anyways. And what I'm getting to is, is a functions check. And really, we should be doing a functions check regularly with our weapon. You know, at a minimum, anytime we disassemble our weapon, put it back together, we do any work on it, right? We want to make sure that it's going to function properly. All the design safety devices work in the manner that they're going to work. Uh, and, you know, nothing's going to fail. Uh, now, I'm not going to demonstrate a functions check here because I don't want you to do what I'm going to do for my specific firearm. Uh, what I want to encourage you to do is uh, either contact your manufacturer, look at your owner's manual. A lot of the owner ma owner's manuals don't have them. But a minimum, we should be checking to make sure all the design safety devices work, right, uh, and function properly. Uh, we should be checking to make sure that the firearm goes off. If it's a semi-auto gun, we should be checking to make sure that the disconnector works by resetting the trigger and re-squeezing, pinning the trigger to the rear while we charge it, and things like that. Uh, do a little bit of research. You know, originally I was going to demonstrate a functions check, and I was like, yeah, a lot of different guns out there. Yeah, I don't want you to take what, what I do for my specific uh, model of firearm. Uh, I want to encourage you to actually put in a little bit of effort. I know it's hard. It's asking a lot, right? Uh, but do some research, see what the actual uh, manufacturer's uh, functions check is. If you can't find it, then do some hunting around, uh, you know, or, hey, shoot me a call. I'll, I'll help you find it. So once we've ruled out any mechanical uh, issues with our guns, I want to get into the actual check. Uh, now, first, I generally want to check this with it off my body, 
right? So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just hold my, my holster in one hand, take my pistol, and I'm going to point it in a safe direction. Anytime I'm actioning the, the weapon, I don't want to have anything else in my hand, so I'm going to let the slide go forward. Uh, before I do that, do a, I want to clear it, do a good three-point safety check. I want to check the chamber, source of feed, bolt face the weapon, right? It's not just to check for the presence of ammunition. It's also to, uh, uh, to check for the state of the weapon, since clearing the weapon should be the first step of loading, right? Last chance to check to make sure we want our life to depend on the firearm, right? So three-point safety check, chamber, source of feed, bolt face, good to go. Let the slide go forward. I'm going to keep this pointed down and in a safe direction. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and safely holster this weapon, right? Push it all the way in. Right, ensuring that my finger was indexed high and up so my finger doesn't become a, a cause. Right, then I'm going to unholster the firearm, point it in safe direction, fire off the action. The action should fire. Right, if the action didn't fire, well, well, something commanded that thing to go off when I holstered it. Right, I don't want to follow the rule of three. Right, I'm going to charge it again, pull it out, fire. That's two, racket, holster. Three. Lock the slide to the rear, set it down, right? So rule of three, I did three tests. I should have three goes, right? If at any time during that process something failed, then I need to go through and the, that troubleshooting process and see what happened. You know, was was there something going on in the holster? Did, did you lose your mind and decide to have your finger on the trigger during the holstering process, thus causing it to fire, which would be bad. That's why we always want to keep our uh, trigger fingers indexed high and up outside of the trigger guard, right? But we'd go through that troubling process and then our previous attempts don't count. We want to have three continuous passes at, at a minimum uh, that this should happen. Now, the next thing that we want to check here hmm, is that our holster works when it's in a compressed state, right? So we want to check it when it's on our body. Now, this may not always be... Uh, uh, you know, necessary for like a belt holstered gun. It's it's good practice because you should be doing dry fire. Uh, but especially important if we're carrying inside the waistband, right? Because for inside the waistband holsters, you know, the tension of your belt or your body could cause this to compress, right? And it, it's probably not going to be an issue during the unholstering process, although it could cause increased friction, which may make you decide, like, hey, if you've got an inside the waistband holster that's got a, a friction uh, a screw that, you know, allows it to compress, maybe that's too much. Maybe you need to back it off a little bit, right, and take it out. Uh, but it could compress it enough during that holstering process that could cause it to go off, right? So we want, want to check that. So I'm, I'm wearing one of my fist holsters that's uh, inside the waistband. Uh, so three-point safety check. And I'm a big fan. Always do a good visual clearance of your holster, during the holstering process to make sure that your cover garment, inside uh, uh, garment, uh, whatever, hasn't become an obstruction, right? Uh, you know, hey, there, there's times to do, you might want to do a no-look holster, but even if I was doing a no-look holster, I'd still want to do a good visual clearance, you know, before I, I stick it in the holster to make sure nothing's going on, right? Uh, I should be able to, to do that. I mean, hey, if we practice reloads, right, when we're, we're checking... Uh, in that last critical moment before we insert a magazine, we'll glance down because it's worth it, right? Uh, you know, because I want to make sure that I get that seated and get this weapon into operation. So I should be able to dedicate enough time to, hey, do a good visual clearance of the holster, stick it in, then I can get my eyes back up. So same thing when it's in its compressed state. And again, I'm not going to, you know, bring the gun up in full tactical. I just want to get the weapon out of the holster, point it in a safe direction, and make sure that the weapon actually does fire, right? There's the clear, check. Rule of three, right? Pass, right? Now, again, if, if at any time during that process we'd, we'd gotten a fail, we want to go th down through that troubling troubleshooting process just to make sure that there's nothing going on with our holsters or our weapons that's going to cause that gun to go off, right? Always check your holsters, right? Like I said, holstering, holstering the weapon can be one of the more dangerous things that we do with our, our firearms, right, with our handguns. Make sure that this that these pieces of equipment do what they're supposed to do. Test them for retention. Test them to make sure that it, it's going to hold a weighted handgun, you know, with the, the weight of the magazine in it, so that if you do become inverted, you take a fall, you trip, or something like that, the weapon isn't going to go, you know, skittering, you know, across the street, you know, or across an aisle in a store or something like that. 
if you've got a retention device, if that's within the realm of your requirements, make sure that works so nobody can, you know, snatch a gun off of you. Uh, check that stuff, you know, dry fire. Uh, you, you should also check that, you know, as the seasons change because what we wear changes. Uh, you know, the, the girth of our clothing, you know, our belts might be tighter or looser based off of, uh, you know, our summer clothes, winter clothes, how we draw our weapon, how we can access it can change based off of uh, the clothing that we're wearing for our environment. And the different clothing that we wear for those different environments can pre present uh, hazards that, you know, might not be presented by, by other environments of clothing, clothing, right? Especially during that holstering process. Right, something really to watch out for. Uh, we've all seen news articles of people having, you know, a sheriff having an AD at a gun desk because the little tassel, um, you know, that tightens the waistband of his coat, his winter coat, got in the mix of his holster, holstered, caused it to AD. Right? Uh, yeah. I mean, is is it his fault? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 his fault. It's not the jacket's fault. It's not the holster's fault. It's not the gun's fault. Uh, if that weapon goes off when, you know, if you didn't command it to do so, it's your fault. Whether it's a mechanical failure, equipment whole, uh, failure, whether it's a failure of fundamentals, it's your fault, right? You you should be inspecting, maintaining, uh, being familiar uh, with all the equipment you're carrying, right? But I just wanted to kind of spend a quick moment. You know, I didn't want to deep dive too much into the logic of holster selection. Uh, I'm going to cover that in a different video at a different time. Uh, but what I really wanted to kind of get out there is just safety checks for your holsters, right? Safety checks for your holsters. I've seen a lot of really unsafe holsters out there. Uh, like I said, I picked some up, you know, off of clients. They've just kind of left them in my courses, you know, after they did that check. I'm like, oh, yeah, this, this isn't going to be safe. And they didn't know because, you know, they weren't doing repetitive exercises in their bedroom. You know, they were just sticking a loaded pistol in here, you know, uh, or keeping it in the holster for extended periods of time. And then just putting it on and off with it in the holster. They were never really unholstering or holstering the loaded weapon. They had no idea. They were just carrying it there the whole time, right? So check your stuff, right? Be safe, right? If you have any questions, you know, comments, concerns, post them in the comment section. Uh, you know, hey, just follow the rule. Don't be a douche, right? And uh, I'll be happy to answer your stuff and, and uh, we can talk about it. Other than that, hope you all stay safe, train hard, and have a good one.